Welcome to this video on pathogenesis. Pathogenesis is an interesting concept that is rarely seen. What examples are seen occurring in nature are an exception to the rule of multicellular organism reproduction. Unlike unicellular reproduction observed in microorganisms, for example yeast and bacteria, this is a process of reproduction which completely ignores any of the means that you would have been told growing up or in six education classes. Pathogenesis most commonly occurs in plants, invertebrates, particularly nematodes, fish, amphibians, and reptiles. This video will cover the topic in brief, as it quickly becomes far more complex than can be fit into a practical YouTube video. It also covers a far wider range of biological domains Pathogenesis is a kind of sexual, non-sexual reproduction. As confusing as that description is, it will make sense shortly. The distinguishing feature between sexual and non-sexual reproduction is whether or not a second set of genes are added to and mixed during crossover. In bacteria, the genes are copied into sets that are the same. These then divide along with the cell and cellular contents. This creates two daughter cells that are more and less exactly the same. In sexual reproduction, two different sets of genes that are half of the normal sum total are combined and mixed during crossover. In the case of a human, this is 23 chromosomes from each parent in their respective gender's gamete, whether that is sperm or ovum. Pathogenesis is the hybridization of these two concepts. It involves the viability of the primary gamocyte that is not yet divided into two gametes. This is like the replication and division of bacteria. Unlike the bacteria, there are not two daughter cells, but one. As this is a full 46 chromosomes, it can carry on to be a viable organism in multicellular organisms, in the case of a human. If only one side, or 23 chromosomes, are present, it is not viable and will not develop beyond a single cell. The catch to this is that all offspring will be female, due to the passing of the two female chromosomes from the mother. There are exceptions among birds and insects which use XO and ZW sex chromosomes. Pathogenesis itself is not observed in humans. However, the human is the simplest way of looking at this, as it involves a very simple reproductive system, it involves only one cell, and is comparatively straightforward given the limitations of this. In other species, it becomes somewhat more difficult as they've developed far more complex and intricate evolutionary traits for pathogenesis. Pathogenesis is a necessary mechanism in some species. It has been selected for by evolutionary pressure. In some species, this may be due to areas of geological activity, for example volcanoes and earthquakes. These and other events would drastically cut down the population and possibly prevent reproduction if only sexual reproduction were available. In the case of the Komodo dragon, it produces genetically diverse female offspring, which can reproduce with genetically unique offspring. This ensures that incest does not occur and inbreeding does not occur. This keeps the population relatively diverse. This is unlike the koalas, and other population bottlenecks. Komodo dragons use one of the four main categories of parthenogenesis, the four categories being automictic, apomictic, facultative, and obligative. Automictic is very similar in its mechanism to mitotic cell division. The genetic material is replicated and the cell divides. This keeps a full set of 46 chromosomes. This may occur due to defects in the cellular separation apparatus or defects in the spindles and tubules that pull the chromosomes apart. This is not the limit of possible mechanisms, but is two of the more common. Either way, the cell retains the full complement of chromosomes as stated earlier. This then enables the cell to become a viable embryo, despite not having received genetic data from a second gamete. These cells can still have an undergone genetic recombination during anaphase 1 or 2, depending upon when the separation failed to occur. 
This means the offspring may not be a direct clone of the parent. This is less likely to be the case in apomitic or sex-specific parthenogenesis. In this case, the cells will generally be those of an insect or bird, and through the absence of a female-specific chromosome, the X chromosome, the offspring will be male. If they have two X chromosomes, they will be female, as it is in humans, but in the case of birds, these use a ZZ or WW. This is a useful process for bees, where it produces the workers in the queen, who are double carriers of both chromosomes, whereas the males only carry half of the chromosomes. These males are haploid, having only half. In order to be able to use these in reproduction, bees still require a male to reproduce. This creates a genetic diversity. However, the female queen can continue to produce female offspring that will act as workers because of this particular system. This is not true of all species, and in this case it is called facultative parthenogenesis. These species can either reproduce sexually or asexually. This is a very limited trait, and only a small number of species have it. Mayflies are an example, as are zebra sharks, copperhead snakes, and small toothed sawfish. This is very much of a survival mechanism, and it is used to produce the next generation and hopefully male offspring. These are generally stopgap measures. This will allow the next generation to reproduce and then resume the species' growth and expansion with more conventional reproduction methods. Not all species require this to expand their population. There are a large number of lizard species which do not require the opposite gender to reproduce. More accurately, there is no other gender. These species use a process called obligative parthenogenesis. If there is no other gender, then you cannot use any stopgap measures or bridges to get around the need for a second source of genetic material. These species have come from repeated or protracted reliance on the previous three mechanisms of parthenogenesis. This was repeatedly selected for over time. It was weighed as the advantage which gradually replaced the genes predisposing and then dominating the species reproduction mechanisms, particularly considering how it reinforces the effects of inbreeding and reduces the genetic diversity of the population. This has led to obligative parthenogenesis, in which only the female of the species exists, and they reproduce without any assistance whatsoever. This has an impact very similar to that of population bottlenecks. Removing genetic diversity reinforces genes and mutations. These ultimately leave the population vulnerable to disease, environmental pressure, and other evolutionary forces. However, whilst the species is in a state and an environment where they are well suited and well adapted, they will grow very quickly, prospectively twice as fast as any comparative species. These four types of parthenogenesis are not the full extent of the possible mechanisms, but this video does give a brief explanation of what some of the more common and interesting versions are in animals. This is a process not limited to animals, but also occurs in fungi and plants. Tomatoes are an example of this, where some species can self-pollinate between flowers on the same plant, which means the same plant is effectively fertilizing itself. The distinction here is that it is producing two different sex organs on the same plant, which is somewhat different again to parthenogenesis. Thank you for watching this video. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions you may have below.